Uh, so, hello everyone, I'm Claudio. I am postdoc at the Institute for Computational Cosmology in Durham. And I'm, I'm working on simulations with modified gravity. So, what I'm trying to do is using the simulations to find observables that can allow you to learn something about gravity. So, I want to show one particular observable we, we got published couple of weeks ago. Uh, the models in which we are working are Symmetron. The, the, the results I'm going to show are, are for Symmetron and, and FOFR, the usual FOFR everyone works on. I'm not going to show the equations because I guess everyone knows them and if you don't know them, it doesn't matter because at the end they are models <laughs> and they are kind of fashionable and the interesting thing is that they have screening mechanisms. So you recover solar system constraints and they have a fixed force. And that is what I care about. Uh, because these are the questions I want to answer. I, I don't want to rule out the models. I think it's pointless to propose a model and then rule, rule it out. You know, I, I want to detect the models. Uh, so they have a fixed force. I want to detect the fixed force in the cosmological data. And I want to see if we can differentiate between the models. Uh, so uh, the, the story for this paper is that I, I was preparing myself to run big simulations with the symmetry model. And I said, OK, we have to choose the model parameters. So I, I ran several simulations. And I, I made plots like this. Uh, this is a, the relative difference in the power spectra between Symmetron and Lambda CDM for different model parameters. So I, I fixed, for these simulations, I fixed the coupling constants to 1. And then I have different range of the field from 0 0.25 to 1 megaparsec and different redshifts of symmetry breaking. So here you, you switch on the scalar field very late at the very late times, and here you switch it on very, at very early times. And OK, you have models for which the difference in between, between modified gravity and lambda CDM is ordered about 10%. And, and you have features like this break here that doesn't exist here. So you say, OK, I choose models in this region of the parameter space. And then I can have signatures that potentially can be observed. Uh, the bad news are that uh, I said, OK, let's test, let's check the solar system constraints just in case. And, and these are the, the axes here are the two, the same parameters that you have here. And the, the points are the, the simulations. This line, this curve here is the Cassini constraint on gamma. And this is Cassini plus two sigma, three sigma, and 10 sigma. And so you see that the interesting models are ruled out by several, several sigma. Um, and at the end, you end up with these few models here for which the signal is below 1%. Uh, so I was very sad with this because I say we are wasting our time because there is no point. If you are careful with the solar system, you will never see this in cosmology. So I presented this in, in a group meeting, and a friend of mine told me, why don't you take the log of the density be before calculating the power spectrum? Uh, so I did that. I went to my office in 10 minutes. I got this plot and a model that is below 10%. This is, again, the ratio between lambda CDM and modified gravity. Models that are below 10% at k equal 10, they go up to above 20%, uh, So, which potentially can be detected. So I was very happy, but then I look at the literature and Lucas already published this. Uh, this is exactly the same plot you see below there. Is the log? Uh, there is a, this. This paper is about clipping, but he showed the log transform. So I said, okay, what what else we can do? I mean, I think the idea is nice, so let's try to go forward. And so I sit down in the computer and I I started testing with different functions. Just on a crackpot level. Just any function that was on my head, I was putting it in. Uh, and I came up with this transformation at the end of the day. I mean, uh, so this is the original density distribution. This is the log transform that I just showed. And this is what we call the restricted log transform, which is a log transformation, but then you apply a caution to it. So what you are doing is basically, essentially looking at the density contour. So with the long transform, what you do is you underweight the halos. With this transform, you underweight the halos and underweight the voids. So 
At the end of the day, the halos and the voids end up being under dense regions. And I'm looking at the power spectrum of a thin region around the, the halos. And when you do that, you see that the difference in between the models, here it was about 20%, here it's about 30%, the actual, the, the whole difference. And it's, it's exactly the same data. I'm not changing the data. It's exactly the same simulation. If you do the analysis everyone does, you get below 10%. If you are careful regarding the function you are using to weight the density, uh, you can actually get signal and you, you move it to larger scales where the variance are subdominant. So we got this published here and the question is, the question is about the noise. Uh, because with this I'm restricting the density and you, you might think that okay, the error bars will go larger. You see here that the error bars are not crazy but we wanted to measure it, so we ran 100 lambda CDM and 50 simetron simulations uh, with uh, 512 cube particles and 256 megaparsecs. And these are the covariance matrices that come out of this. So you see that for the usual density, the covariance matrix is not diagonal, and there are a lot of terms outside the diagonal, which is not, it's not good. Uh, the log transform basically it doesn't diagonalize the covariance, but it makes it more diagonal. This is something people know already. Essentially what you do is, with the log transform, you transfer non-Gaussian information to the two-point function. So, um, so the correlation matrix gets better. And for the restricted log transform, this is the, the correlation matrix we get. Basically what happens is that the power spectrum, instead of moving up and down, it, it tilts around a particular scale. But so we have these matrices and we calculated the signal to noise. For the usual density, for these simulations is 85. And you see that for the log transform it goes up and for the restricted log transform goes even higher. And this is the, the variance at the particular scale. Uh, you see that the error bars go down. I mean, the, so it's a win-win situation. I mean, you you increase the difference between the models with these transformations and you increase the signal to noise. Um, so I think this is one of the ways we should go to, to test modify gravity and, and GR. Uh, there is one question about the parameters. I have three parameters in my transform. And the question from the referee was like, how do you choose the parameters? You are, you are cheating here. And, and the way we choose the parameters is by trying all the parameters. We look at the parameter space. Uh, we have essentially the, the the mean of the Gaussian, you know, the center of the Gaussian and the dispersion. And these are exactly those values. This is the mean and this is the dispersion. And you see that for some parameters, this is some kind of a scalar representation of the total deviation. It's some kind of integral. So the higher this number, the higher the difference between the models. For some parameters, the difference goes to zero, but some, for some parameters, it's very high. So you say, oh, okay, I just choose parameters in this region and then I can. Uh, but there is one little problem, which is the signal to noise. Uh, if you take models in this region, the signal to noise actually goes to zero there. Because what, what happens is that these are essentially voids. Uh, so you are looking at the power spectrum of those voids. So you have no galaxies in there. So the signal to noise is, is very small. So the trick is to choose parameters that maximize this plot and this plot at the same time. So the, when, when you, and that, that's the way we, we look at, um, that's the way we, we choose the parameters. Uh, so the, the idea of the test is that you give me a model or anyone else, and you should make this plot with your transformation and find the, the region of the parameter space in which the transformation performs better than than the usual the usual density. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And the other thing, so the second second part of my talk is about something completely different. Uh, I think on Monday or Tuesday, Hans was talking about the Cola way of accelerating simulations. Uh, it's an approximate method for getting the simulations to run faster. Uh, this is a different method, and the difference uh, between COLA and this one is that this one is, is exact. Uh, you get 
the same accuracy of a simulation, but it runs much faster. Uh, so the idea is the following. Uh, you know that for these uh, new surveys we are having, people is running very large simulations because they want to have the whole survey in the box. So say you have a, this is a space-time diagram, so you have space time here, you have an observer there, and this is the light cone of your observer. So say, suppose you have a survey that will observe galaxies until this redshift. What people is doing is to take a box size such that you contain the whole survey in the box. Which for, for instance, for the Euclid project, the, the last simulation they run is 6 gigaparsecs box. And the output from that simulation, it was a massive effort. They run the simulation and they output the light cone and they throw away all your data. So you are, you are using computing time to calculate the dynamics of galaxies that are outside the light cone and then you don't output them. You, you just throw them away, which is a waste of time, a waste of energy, it's a waste of everything. So I said, why, if you want to output the light cone, just, just simulate the light cone. So you want to simulate these dark gray regions, just simulate that, don't simulate a whole box and to reach zero. So the idea is that if you have this little galaxy evolving in time, uh, when the galaxy goes out of the, of the light cone of the observer, you just forget about it and drop the particles. Uh, and this is, this is expected to work because most of the time uh, simulations spend most of the time at low redshift. This is where you increase the number of refinements and you, uh, if you have a tree code, the, the tree becomes very complicated, so most of the time is spent in this region. So, but at that region, the light cone is very small, so you just integrate the light cone. Uh, so that's the idea, and uh, you have the problem with the boundary conditions in the light cone because simulations, standard simulations use periodic boundary conditions. So if there is a particle going out here, it will come out from here, come in from here and the, for the potential also you, you have periodicity. Uh, so to take into account that, what I did is to, and we are having long discussions with the coffees about what equations you should use for that, but I did in, in a very simple way. I mean, you just take a, this is GR, no modified gravity. You know, like a Friedman with a scalar perturbation. You plug that in Einstein's equation, you end up, the TT equation is a diffusion equation. Uh, then you can change the, the gauge such that this term disappears, but what I did is to keep that term. And so this equation, information propagates at finite speed with this equation. Uh, so I integrated this, I included this equation in my embodied code. I have a PM code for this kind of things, for testing new methods. The, the method I'm using is an alternate direction explicit, which is some technicality of numerics that you probably don't care, but it's just a method. And, and this is the result you get. You, you get. I mean, I, I run simulations with this, these box sizes and this number of particles, and I, I output a light cone, and I calculated the power spectrum of the light cone. So the power spectrum you see here, this is frequency, and this is the power spectrum. Uh, this is the smallest box, this line. You see the nonlinear feature there, everything's fine. If you go to the larger box, what happens is that if you calculate the power spectrum of a light cone, you are mixing low redshift zero with high redshift information. So the total power goes down, but that's okay. I don't care about that for this particular project. What I care is comparing the power spectrum of the usual technique with the power spectrum of the shrinking domain technique. And this is the relative difference. You see that is the highest difference you get is 10 to minus 4. Uh, so what this plot is telling you is that running a periodic box of 6, six gigaparsecs or a box that is, has open boundary conditions and, and shrinks in time is exactly the same from the point of view of the power spectrum. You, there is no difference. Uh, but this is the time the simulation took to run. Uh, so I have the high resolution simulations here and low resolution, uh, sorry, the high resolution here and low resolution here. So if you use a standard algorithm, you run in, in one day, 25 hours. 
This is expansion factor and this is the time, elapsed time, cumulative time uh, per time step. Uh, so the, the total time of the simulation was 25 hours. And if you shrink the box with time, you simulate only the light cone. Uh, you get this curve, so you see that the, there is a speed up of a more than factor of three. Um, so that's it. It runs faster. And I get exactly the same accuracy, the, exactly the same power spectrum. Um, you might say a factor of three is not impressive. I will not buy, I will not include this in my code because it's too much effort. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that this is a particle mesh code. There are no refinements in here, so it's just a PM. I have 1024 cube particles and 1024 cube cells. Uh, but in state-of-the-art codes, you know, you, you have refinements and you have structure. The grid is not uniform. It, it increases resolution, so it, it gets really heavy at low redshift. So I'm hoping, I'm including these interruptions now, and I'm hoping that this curve will actually go down uh, below, below this number. I think this is a conservative number. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say. It's uh, density transformations are cool. Use them because they can help you to extract more information from the same density fields. The thing I still have to do to fully convince you probably is to calculate because the signal to noise there is a theoretical assuming a perfect density distribution. Uh, what I have to do is to include the noise associated to surveys, you know, like short noise or holes in the surveys and stuff like that. But I am hoping that it's, it will still work. Um, and the other thing I talked about was about shrinking the box size while the simulation runs. And there is a, a speed up of a factor of three at least, and hopefully more. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Questions? It's perfectly possible that the answer is no, but in addition to the noise, do you possibly also introduce biases due to, uh, for instance, foregrounds or systematic effects that haven't been maybe completely removed and then when you do the transformation, uh, then perhaps they, uh, I mean, they also get enhanced and stuff. So have you thought about that? Does it happen? Yes, I'm thinking about that. Um, I was going to say something and it just went away. Uh, so for instance, uh, you could say what happened with baryons, uh, because I said this moves to large scales. But you know, baryons, they will affect the power spectrum beyond k equal one, or roughly. Uh, but when I do these transformations, could it be that the effect of baryons actually moves to this range of scales, and then at the end of the day, I screw up everything? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, in Durham, you know, we have the Eagle simulation, we have big galaxy formation simulations. And what we are doing now is testing what happens when you apply these transformations to the baryonic simulation, including galaxy formations, Taylor, feedback, whatever. And yeah, at the end of the day, it's when, uh, at the end of the day, what you want to do is to find a transformation that is sensitive to modify gravity and insensitive to baryons. So you reduce the baryonic effect and increase the modified gravity effect. Uh, but that's, that's work in progress, yeah. Yeah, in fact, another thing I was thinking is we already use bias traces. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how this is going to. Uh, that's your thing. We, yeah, OK, yeah, uh, I'm not doing that. But uh, yeah, ideally, you want to work. Well, OK, there are, it depends what you want to observe. Here I'm looking at the power spectrum of the density dark matter density as it comes from the simulation. But in reality, you will have uh, a galaxy catalog with a, a specific specific Windows function, and that has to be done. The other thing you can do is to go for lensing and work with the kappa map. I will be probably closer to this. Uh, or say 25, 21 centimeters, whatever. But so that is what I said in the last slide. I mean, you have to include the observational effects into this calculation. This is a purely theoretical uh, calculation, yes. Uh, 
uh, just related to this question, actually. I mean, you could also consider different parameters. I mean, uh, a range of different parameters, like doing some sort of density tomography, and then you would actually break these degeneracies with baryons and neutrinos. So that, that's you consider like adding a third plot where you optimize uh, the signal to noise, uh, and, and as well as as a sort of uh, breaking the degeneracy, let's say, with a bionic, bionic effect. Yeah, yeah so uh, I mean, if you see in this region of the plot, the difference between lambda CDM and symmetron, or, or yeah, this symmetron is zero. So the two spectra are degenerated. Uh, what I want to do is to put a plot here that has the same plot, but for the difference between lambda CDM and lambda CDM plus neutrinos, for instance, and find the region of the parameter space that gives me high signal to noise high signal for the neutrinos and low signal for gravity, for instance. In, a, in that case, you can break the degeneracy the same with, with baryons. So that, that is work in progress, yeah. More, more questions? One more. Yeah, the fact that uh, your signal to noise depends so much on how you, you do this actual restricted log transform, does it imply that maybe instead of looking at the power spectrum, maybe you need to, to have another another estimator, like maybe go to, instead of the two-point correlation, maybe there's the information is hidden in the three-point or the four-point correlation function. And maybe looking at that in your simulation, you could then pinpoint where the, 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 the most sensitive uh, probe, the, the most sensitive observable are Yes. Uh, do you plan on, on going beyond just the uh, spectrum? I'm not planning. So if you look at the literature, there is a lot of people studied a lot the log transform, not, not the restricted log that is something we invented now, but the log transform. And, and it is well known that with the log transform, you transfer information from the three-point function into the two-point function. But it's, it's much simpler to calculate, calculate the two-point function with the transformation than the three-point function. So. The idea of these transformations is to simplify the calculations but get the same information out of it. Uh, so for the moment, I'm not thinking about going for higher order statistics. Uh, uh, Thank you. So uh, Matthew is the next speaker.